neurology and the stroke program at East South Southwest will be here at 10 and she has a she has an hour window to do her section so I have to get rid of my section before that time so uh, <coughs> as you as you know that may be very difficult with me uh, we're going to talk about stroke today a reminder on the board March 13th at Peace Health is the trauma case review breakfast is served at 715 uh, and it's actually pretty good uh, but uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Timmons you recall Dr. Timmons she's the paramedic become trauma surgeon uh, she'll be she'll be uh, providing the case and it's a traumatic brain injury case one of the cases that you guys brought in so hmm? yeah <laughs> okay so um, I'm going to go very fast through a lot of this stuff. Stroke. We're going to do stroke didactic this month. Next month in the skill sessions, it'll be stroke practice. Not that you get to practice having a stroke. You get to practice dealing with a stroke. Uh, you can practice having a stroke, too, and then we can work on you. Stroke uh, kills about uh, 130,000 Americans every year. Uh, out of and that's out of about 800,000 stroke victims per year in the US. Um, most of these are new strokes, but that means that 200,000 people have a repeat stroke every year. Uh, now, 87% of all strokes are ischemic strokes. Stroke is the leading cause of serious long-term disability interesting slide here showing stroke death rates by adults age 35 and older by county in the United States the really dark ones are the counties you don't want to live in because so yes yeah but that ca that deep fried catfish will go down really good you know but you won't be able to swallow um, now looking up in here so we're in the pretty good stroke areas uh, now this is adjusted for county this is adjusted it's a always always we do medical occurrence rates by either hundred thousand usually it's a hundred thousand population that's what this is and obviously when you get to Skamania County there's not a hundred thousand but they do a mathematical adjustment as if there were a hundred thousand so uh, so Skamania County, now, why are some of these purple and not, well, probably because they're long ways away from medical care, probably because they're, they don't recognize that they're having a stroke. One of the problems with stroke is just like it used to be with a heart attack is people have to recognize the symptoms. So the, the stroke, Heart Association, Stroke Association has been really pushing on that. Now, surprisingly, I'm really surprised that Arizona has such a, because there's so damn many old people there. I don't know. You know, but maybe they're already, you know, you can't tell if it's a head of stroke. I don't know. So, now, ischemic strokes. You're, you know, remember, 87% of all strokes are ischemic in origin. They're either occlusive from a thrombus. Usually, the thrombus comes from someplace else. It can occur de novo, but in the brain, it usually comes from someplace else, like from atrial fibrillation and a little, little clot off the, off the valve. Or it comes a thrombosis off the carotid if the carotids have a partial occlusion due to plaque. Um, and so, I mean, that's an embolic stroke. So a thrombus can occur right at the site if you've got low flow and hypercoagulability. Low flow and hypercoagulability happen when you get to be old. The anterior circulation is the part of the, uh, the, part of the brain that's provided its blood supply by the uh, carotids. And the internal carotids serve the cerebral hemispheres. 
The posterior circulation is the vertebral basilar circulation. It comes up the back, and it starts to serve the brain stem and the cerebellum first, and then communicates with the circle of Willis. We've got a picture later on. Hemorrhagic strokes come in two basic flavors, either subarachnoid hemorrhage which from an aneurysm, most common in aneurysm, also arteriovenous malformations, uh, you're born with a defect that causes the artery and the vein to interconnect without having a capillary system in between. So all the pressure of the arteries directly goes into the vein, which is very pliable, very, it, it, it expands and ultimately ruptures, and you have essentially um, um, the same thing as you have with an aneurysm then. Then there's intracerebral bleeding, hemorrhagic stroke. Hypertension is the most common cause, so generally uh, with el older persons or persons who have um, long-standing hypertension. And then in the elderly, the, there's a degeneration of the, of the artery called amyloid angiopathy, and, and that can rupture then to the, it's a weak vessel. Now, there's a few risk factors for stroke. Some are modif you can change, some you can't change. You can't change your age, you keep getting older. I mean, that is the best alternative. Uh, you can't change your gender. You can try, but you can't change your genetic gender. Um, race, uh, blacks, Latinos are a little bit uh, more likely to have hypertensive bleeding strokes more likely to have diabetes. Previous CVA, once you've had a CVA, a stroke, your risk factor is doubled or tripled to have another one. You've already proven you can have one. And then heredity. Uh, there are certain things like the propensity to amyloid uh, angiopathy would run in families. Things you, things you can modify. If you're hypertensive, you can change that. You stop tobacco. Tobacco increases your risk of stroke about threefold. History of TIAs. <laughs> if you have a history of TIA, if you became blind one day in one eye and then all of a sudden, it, and then it went away, you really should get worked up to find out where that, where your, where your stroke's going to come from. Heart disease, obviously, uh, AFib. There's a bit of controversy right now because after the age of 75, you know, people who are on atrial fibrillation, we commonly have them on Coumadin, and now the newer, the newer anticoagulants uh, for a, a number of reasons. But this is to stop the possibility of, a, of an embolic stroke uh, from that valve. Pr after age 75, your risk, you begin to have a risk-benefit issue that your risk of falling and having intracerebral bleed from, from being anticoagulated is probably greater than your risk of having a stroke if you haven't had a stroke up to that point. If you don't have diabetes and you don't have hypertension, probably, you, you know, there's a thought that we maybe shouldn't keep you on anticoagulants after age 75. Now, other things, if you're hypercoagulable, you have a chance, more likelihood of having a clot. So if you have, uh, and, and, and things like Pregnancy, cancer, uh, recent surgery increases the risk of de novo coagulation. And so you could end up with a stroke. So you can adjust that by when people are, have had surgery, we often keep them on Lovenox or an or a anticoagulant for a while. Even aspirin therapy is effective. Sickle cell disease, uh, which is very rare around here. Uh, if you have a history of carotid brewery, uh, that means you've got uh, plaque and you've got a narrowing of your carotids. Uh, it's the thing we're supposed to listen. For. Remember when we, when you listen, when you're going to do a, a carotid sinus massage, which we don't hardly do anymore as a vagal maneuver if you're treating uh, 
um, someone with uh, PSVT, um, have to listen to make sure they don't have a brewery because older persons with a brewery, you sort of rub on that and you break the, you can break the plaque loose and the stroke will run on the spot. It means, however, that with the narrowing, with the brewery, you've got a narrowing, you've got a, a risk of a stroke that needs to be taken care of. Now, in ischemic strokes, and we're going to talk mostly about ischemic strokes, um, it's involved, so if your stroke involves the anterior circulate, the carotid circulation, this is characteristically, this, this is where the stroke presents as unilateral para paralysis on the opposite side from the stroke. So you stroke on the left side, you're paralyzed on the right because there's a crossover at the, uh, as everything leaves the brain. You have numbness also on the, other, on the opposite side of the stroke, but it's on the same side as the paralysis. If you stroke in the uh, hemispheres that are involving uh, hearing and language, so mid-temporal, you're aphasic, which is difficult comprehension, uh, nonsense speech, uh, difficulty in reading and writing. They can, they can read, but they can't, they can't articulate what they read. Uh, dysarthria, slurred speech, abnormal pronunciation. And then you have, uh, you can have, you can have visual disturbances with uh, strokes in the, in the anterior circulation, carotid circulation, and monocular blindness on the same side as the stroke. That's from an occlusion of the optic nerve, basically. That eye becomes blind. Now, in the vertebral basilar circulation, primary symptoms are going to be vertigo, visual disturbances because it's supplying the occipital cortex, so both eyes are affected simultaneously. And because of uh, often at the, the where the where the nerve the the um, uh, where the nerves pass out of the optic chiasm, uh, you can have uh, in, in the brain you can have diplopia because the uh, 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 one one eye is basically somewhat palsied, somewhat paralyzed, so it moves out of sync of the other one, it develops central diplopia. Or discongenent gaze, it's asynchronous movement. We all know about discongenent, we see discongenent gaze often after seizures, but also after strokes. And that's involving the vertebral basilar system. You can also have paralysis, numbness, dysarthria, and ataxia because the, because the the posterior circulation and the anterior circulation communicate with each other in the so-called circle of Willis. Willis was a neuroanatomist who described this so that you have, if your vertebral basilar system is plugged up, you can get some collateral flow back through the circle of Willis and feed anterior to posterior. And the same work, if you have, if a, and your anterior carotid is, is uh, uh, thrombosed, you can get circulation from the other side and from the posterior circulation. It keeps us going most of the time. Hemorrhagic strokes, subarachnoid hemorrhage, the symptoms of subarachnoid hemorrhage may be sudden, severe headache. Now, that's the classic the so-called thunderclap headache. It happens so suddenly. And it's also always described just like the migraine patients always come in and say, it's the worst headache I've ever had. Well, it's not in their case, but this is the worst headache you'll probably ever have. Transient loss of consciousness may be, pre so sudden severe headache associated with Decreased level of consciousness or actual collapse is pretty, pretty, you know, that, that's an ischemic, that's a subarachnoid hemorrhage until proven otherwise. Often associated with nausea and vomiting, your 
brain doesn't like blood in there. It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be inside the vessels, not in the subarachnoid space. Neck pain because the meninges are irritated. So you get like meningismus. You get like the pain you get from meningitis. Intolerance of noise and light. It's sort of like, that's how it's sometimes confused with my, migraines can be confused with that. That's why we pay a lot of attention to people who ha say they have this sound and light intolerance and severe headache and all that. And even though we know they probably have a migraine. <coughs> Altered mental status. Now, the characteristic of subarachnoid hemorrhage, if you're lucky, is that you have a a herald bleed, a, pr a premonitory bleed. You have a minor subarachnoid hemorrhage that gives you severe headache, some of these symptoms, and then it seems to be getting better. And that's nature's way of telling you to go in and get a CAT scan and a few other things because you're going to have a big one after the fact. It's going to happen again. So our job is to work them up very quickly from that. Intracerebral hemorrhage, whatever symptoms you have depend on where it bleeds in the brain. So if it's in the uh, temporal side, then you're going to have the same thing as you have with an ischemic stroke, aphasia, uh, loss of uh, 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 maybe paralysis on one side, uh, numbness on one side, maybe sudden collapse as well. A lot of things we consider in the differential diagnosis of stroke. Head and cervical trauma. Obviously, you have to. No. So you're, it's a confusing thing. If you have somebody who's, you find someone old who's down, they've fallen. You don't know if they hit their head, hurt their neck on the way down. We have lots of, lots of old people with, uh, and old, by old people now, we mean more than 55. Um, couple of us here. Um, but yeah, you don't know if you don't know if they if they you know, we have lots of pe older people who who break their necks, who have intracerebral bleeds because of the medication they're on. Um, men so you have to protect their neck. Meningitis, encephalitis can cause symptoms of a stroke because the brain is infected. Hypertensive encephalopathy, you can have stroke symptoms without having the stroke yet. We know that. That's why we treat some persons who have hypertensive encephalopathy but who don't have focal neurologic finding. We don't, we don't bring their blood pressure down quickly. If someone has just confusion, no focal neurologic findings, and they're frankly hypertensive, we try to lower their pressure slightly to improve that. Intracranial masses, uh, tumors, uh, epidural and subdural hematomas can cause stroke symptoms, but direct pressure on the brain. Essentially, it's causing ischemic stroke symptoms by compressing the, the, the uh, blood vessels. Now, Todd's paralysis is an interesting thing. One of the differentials is if a patient's had a seizure, then they will have temporary, they says a brief temporary paralysis on one side of the body. Essentially stroke-like symptoms. Seizure, paralysis and numbness on one side of the body. Now, it says brief, but I've seen it go for three days. Now, how do you know that, that? So what we do now is we do more evaluation and we don't use TPA on someone who has had a seizure at the same time their stroke symptoms presented. So if the patient has a history of this, has, a, has had a seizure, if the, if the bystanders say, you know, he was jerking and twitching and he, and he was unconscious briefly and then he seems to be paralyzed afterwards. We will not use TPA on that person. They will get 
further workup to determine if they really do have a stroke or if this is Todd paralysis because we don't give TPA just for fun. Migraines can cause, you can have a paralytic migraine, they can, have, they can, they can be paralyzed, and they can lose vision in part of their visual field. Um, uh, so migraines are one of the rule out if they have stroke symptoms. Then their metabolic problems, hyper, hypoglycemia can cause stroke symptoms, hyperglycemia to some extent, but hypoglycemia certainly can. People can be semi-comatose semi and, and have decreased, uh, and they can essentially have paralysis. Post-arrest ischemia, but we don't generally TPA people who you've brought in because you've got ROSC and they're not moving one side. That's probably just because they've had a little ischemic brain uh, effect for that time period. Drug overdoses. Well, they're not truly paralyzed, but they're paralyzed, you know, from the drug overdose. There's a differential, there's a, a, a little mnemonic that we use for the differential diagnosis of stroke. It's AEIOU and TIPS. Uh, basically, alcohol, endocrine, epilepsy, encephalopathy. I, there'll be a test at the end on this. Uh, infection, including sepsis. Opiate overdose, any other overdose, uremia, uh, renal, uh, end stage renal sepsis, if you will, um, trauma, hypogly insulin, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, poisoning, psychosis. Psychotic people can act like they've had strokes. And then stroke, seizure and syncope, even after syncope. Our, our stroke chain for survival is detection, early symptom recognition, which is why the Stroke Association goes, you know, has public service announcements and things. And they go through, if you've seen any of them recently, they, they, they go through showing people who have um, what we use, you know, the, the Cincinnati Stroke Scale to evaluate at home to say if you have, you know, facial droop and, and, and slurring of your speech, you know, call 911. Don't wait. Don't call your daughter who lives in Arizona. Uh, dispatch, prompt EMS, we've got that down. Delivery, uh, transportation, appropriate pre-hospital care, pre-arrival notification. And then because the mainstay of early onset stroke now is if it can be treated at all, it's going to be treated with TPA in that first three, three and a half hour window. Uh, then we want rapid door data and decision to make to, to, to uh, do TPA or not. So rapid decision making. Now, um, Recognition, we have public education of stroke symptoms, early access to medical care. You have early, and we have early dispatch and pre-dispatch instructions. Um, and we have, we've been, they've been training the EMDs, the dispatchers to recognize stroke symptoms more. Matter of fact, they go through a, a modified uh, stroke scale with some patients now. Our, our patients are improving. This is, uh, this shows the areas of the state. This is two years ago that were the initial, uh, uh, signed up initially to the, all the, the, the hospitals and dispatch systems to, to this uh, early stroke network uh, through the when, the, when the law was written two years ago that required stroke hospitals. And stroke hospitals, if you say you're a stroke hospital, you have to, prove that you can do be a stroke hospital. Now, for us in EMS, we do the FAST exam. Uh, face, normal, equal bilateral movement, abnormal, unilateral weakness or drooping. 
arm, normal. Both arms move equally or not at all. Abnormal means one arm drifts compared to the other. Now, ideally, your patient is sitting up, at least in a semi-fowler, and hands are out, palms down. Close their eyes. And if it drifts away, that's positive. That's, a, that's abnormal. That's a drift. Speech. Normal speech. Abnormal. Slurred speech, inappropriate words, incomprehensible words. And then the most important thing is you do is establish time. Onset of symptoms or last known well. If they wake with the symptoms, we say now that at least with uh, Peace House Southwest, we'll say that that's the onset of their symptoms. It actually turns out probably to be so. That people, that that's what wakes them up, is the stroke. Now, if you get there and the person is laying, is down on the ground, down on the floor, they can't move one side, and they're drooling from the thing. You don't have to do the fast exam. That's already positive. <laughs> you don't have to sit them up. <laughs> now, stroke. If the person I just described, which you've all seen, they have air potential airway problems because they can't protect their airway. There's some paralysis often of the upper air, upper airway. Uh, they're if they're drooping on their face on one side, those muscles in their throat are also somewhat paralyzed. They may be vomiting, especially if they have a hemorrhagic stroke. They may be in a coma, so they can't protect their airway. They may, they may be actively seizing while you're there. And they may have cervical trauma. They need oxygen if they're under 94%. They don't need oxygen if their oxygen saturation is 98. Matter of fact, that may be contraindicated. It is contraindicated in a stroke, just like it is with a, with a STEMI. You don't need, or especially with ROSC, you don't need 100% oxygen because you don't know how much that really is. And oxygen toxicity in an ischemically damaged brain is not good for you. They need an MPA or an OPA if they can tolerate it. Suction is needed. Put on the uh, on the paralyzed side. If you know if you don't have to protect their neck, or if you can protect their neck even in, a, in, in that size, so they don't aspirate, or they need to be intubated to protect their airway. Your job is to protect their airway. If you think it's an intracranial bleed, and if their blood, pr if they're if they're showing any signs of Cushing's triad, hypertension, slow heart rate, erratic breathing, then keep their, keep their CO2 at about 35 max. They may have irregular breathing pattern, chain stokes, central neurogenic hyperventilation. <laughs> so, um, and they may be paralyzed. So you may have to aggressively manage that. Circulation problem with the stroke. Potential problem, hypertension, hypotension, and dysrhythm. If they're hypertension, don't lower their blood pressure in the field. Don't attempt to lower it with nitro, nitrates, or anything because they've already got focal neurologic findings. They've got a stroke. If you lower the pressure, you basically lower the intracranial pressure and you have the more expansion of whatever it is that the stroke is causing, either edema or bleed. If they're hypotensive, we try to get their target blood pressure up to about 100 to 110 certainly above 90, just like you will with stroke, with uh, um, uh, trauma. Treat dysrhythms, 
as needed. AFib is common, but they usually are in, all you do is look at their medications, they're on Coumadin, you know they've been on AFib. Don't try to convert the AFib. We don't shock them unless, the, well, I suppose if they're, if, if the problem is that if they're ticking along at uh, 200 in AFib, we might have to treat that and treat that the way you would any AFib. If it's emergent, it might be, have to be shocked. Otherwise, we'd probably use diltiazem to slow it down. So, dysrhythms as needed, IV access, correct hypoglycemia, and prompt transport. In this county, we're now changing this a little bit, so listen up to this one. This will be a slight change to your orders, very slight, and I'll identify where it is. Transport emergently, code 3 transport, if the patient, and call in and say, I'm coming with da-da-da-da-da, uh, code 3 stroke. Now, so emergently, if there's less than 8-hour onset, Less than eight hour onset of aphasia, facial droop, unilateral weakness or paresthesia, inability to understand, verbalize, understand, loss of vision in one eye or, visu or the visual field, vertigo, sudden onset, persistent, progressive with headache, and or they went to bed normal and woke with the symptoms. We'll still call that within eight hours. That's code three transport. So acute stroke symptoms, less than an hour. The destination hospital, we're going to go through the thrombolytic. If they fail the thrombolytic checklist, if you have time to do the thrombolytic checklist and they fail it, they, want, oh, they go to Peace Health. If they're 80 years or old, Peace Health. Symptom onset, two to eight hours. Peace Health. Suspected intracranial hemorrhage, Peace Health. Symptom onset less than two hours. Closest stroke center could be Legacy or Peace Health or the patient family ch choice. Symptom onset greater than eight hours, closest stroke center or patient family choice. Beyond eight hours, they're probably not going to get intervention or they're probably not going to get intervention or, tr or T and they're definitely not going to get TPA. The reason it's the two-hour thing is when you get to the scene, when you make first patient contact, you know you're going to take at least 15 minutes at the scene. I say at least. That's what I'm you're supposed to do is 15 minutes that scene. And the average around here in town is going to be 15 minute transport to the hospital. So that's 30 minutes off the thing. Then we get 45 to, a, I know how things work. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour to get the CT, to get all the labs back, to get the CT read, to get the neurologist to evaluate the patient, and to get the drug up from the, from the pharmacy to start TPA. So if the patient fits the criteria to be able to have TPA, that's an, that's an hour and a half gone already. We have a three and a half hour window. So you get to have two hours on your end to say, yeah, I was normal at 7 o'clock, it's now 9 o'clock, you mean, okay, you can boogie. You can go to either hospital at that point. If they say, gosh, you know, I woke up at uh, 7 o'clock and uh, uh, I was okay, and at 7.30 uh, I started having, you know, I was eating, and I started drooling and dribbling my food, and I couldn't move this side, and now it's 11 o'clock. It's out of the window for easy TPA. It means more evaluation. It means the neurologist has to do more testing. We have to do more CT. And they may go to an intervention. Peace Health is where you can do intervention. Intervention means intra-arterial TPA or 
intraarterial removal of the clot with uh, a, a type of clot extractor. So it was a lot easier when there was only one hospital, but that two, look at that two-hour window. That's what you need to take them to either hospital. If it's within that two-hour window, that's fine. If it's beyond that two-hour window, they should go to Peace Health because that's where we can do interventions. Yep. Uh, stroke centers in Portland would be primarily uh, Providence and, well, actually, the main stroke center in Portland, the one that, we, that Peace Health refers to when they have an interventional case, is OHSU. But Pro both Providence and Legacy, um, Good Sam will do interventional stuff as well. And, yeah, they all say they do, so, but I mean, you're not going to drive all the way to Meridian Park. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, um, Emmanuel was cer can certainly do. Now, they may, not, they may not be able to take an acute stroke in a, in a They'll, you'll have to call and see on the cath lab. What happened in Portland is everybody decided they wanted to play. And that's not a good system, but that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah, Prov Portland. And if you wanted to go all the way to Prov uh, uh, St. Vincent's, but that's a kind of a, that takes you out of service for a little while. Now. This is the thrombolytic checklist, and I have to do a little, uh, a little um, uh, addendum up here. This does not, quote, exclude the patient from, but this ex excludes the patient from going to a place where they can't do intervention. Because if they fail any of these things, then they need more evaluation by the interventionalist. Because uh, they still may be able to get TPA if they've had a hemorrhagic stroke in less than a year, depending on what their CAT scan and the CTA would show. But they need more time to do that. You know, it's going to take more time. They may need an MRI at the same time. So, uh, so these are the kind of things that would rule you out for going to a place that's only going to use TPA, that has the ability to use TPA. So. Uh, uh, hemorrhagic stroke recently, intracranial pathology. No, they have to. They have. They have to tell you that, or someone has to say, "Yeah, they fell down and they, you know, whacked their head and they had a fracture and they bled into their brain a little bit, but they seem to be okay now." Uh, active internal bleeding, not, not, not menstrual period. Suspected aortic dissection. Well, that's hard for you to suspect. Chest pain, tearing, tearing chest pain in uh, radiating to the back, uh, associated with a stroke symptom, that could well be an aortic dissection. That has to be worked up. But you probably want to take that to a place where you can do major workup. Uncontrolled hypertension, current use of anticoagulants, and we have a case, uh, we have a case I think we're talking about that well, there's a recent case I know that we couldn't use, uh, uh, we, that they couldn't get uh, uh, TPA because they, they were too anticoagulated from their medication. Um, recent trauma, major trauma, not I fell down and sprained my ankle. CPR, prolonged. Major surgery, recent internal bleeding, known allergies, Jaundice, hepatitis, kidney failure, which we would work up. That would not necessarily exclude them, but they need probably interventional stuff. And terminal illness and pregnancy, we probably don't. That, that's the decision of the patient, the family, and, and the specialist. But you probably want to be at a place where you can have major intervention if you need to. Remember, the stroke team is going to need more information usually medical aid, particularly if the patient's not conversant or if they have aphasic speech. So we want the patient present, if the, the, the family present if possible. 
if it's not feasible to bring a family member in with, get a phone number that they, and tell them to stay by the phone. Critical actions for you, assess and support cardiorespiratory function, assess and support blood glucose, assess and support oxygenation and ventilation, assess neurologic function, you're fast, determine precise time of symptom onset, determine essential medical information, emergent transport to the appropriate ED and notify the ED that a possible stroke patient is en route. Code three stroke. Now, when you get there, you should be met by the nurse and the ED physician within, within moments. The problem, now, because your code three stroke will go out as a code three stroke page, but it will not become, at least at Peace Health, will not become a neuro 911, which is our code for calling the whole team. So you get a small team, you get the ED doc, the nurses, uh, and lab techs, uh, CT is put on standby, and the physician will do the initial evaluation and the initial, his, his or her initial evaluation is much more complicated than yours and it's more refined to sort out this, these, whether this is truly a stroke or not a stroke. They may then call this a neuro 911 which steps the process up and gets the stroke neurologist involved. Now, often the stroke neurologist is in the department at the same time, and they'll just walk over from whatever they're doing when they hear a code three stroke. They, they may then say, no, this doesn't fit neuro, for whatever reason, this doesn't fit neuro 911. This patient will not go, to, will not get TPA. We need to do further evaluation and possibly interventional stuff, but they'll work that out. In the ED, in the first 10 minutes, they're going to do reassess the ABCs, vital signs, provide oxygen as needed, IV access if you didn't already have it, get the blood sample for CBC, electrolytes, and the coagulation studies, whether they're on or not on anticoagulants. Get a 12 lead if you don't already have it. You probably have it. They'll get another one. Put them on a monitor. Check the sugar if you hadn't done it before. Alert the stroke team. And they're going to perform a general neurologic screening assessment. And this is a, you know, I, I'm not, I'm just going to explain this one. You don't, you're not expected to know this one. We haven't taken this out to the field yet because it's fairly, in, it's quite involved as, you can, as you're about to see. This is the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale, NA, NIHSS provides a quantitative measure of stroke-related neurologic deficit, and it's something that can, you, can com, you can compare, at, you, so you do it at different times, and you compare the results as you're going along to see if the patient's improving, staying the same, or getting worse. And there's good interrelator correlation here, which means that if I test you and come up with an NIHSS score of Eight, that means one of my partners will test you and come up with a seven or a nine, and so it, it's, it's close. Or they'll come up with an eight. It also predicts short and long-term outcome. And we use it as a data collecting tool, too. It's 11 items. And number 1A, level of consciousness. And it goes from zero to three. Zero is alert keenly responsive, and three is responds only with reflex motor or autonomic effects to stimulation. So they're basically unresponsive or flaccid. Not good. Level of consciousness questions. Ask the patient their age and current month. Zero answers. Both corrections correctly. That means you have to know both their age and the current month. And two, answers neither correctly. 1C, commands, level of consciousness, commands, 
Ask patient to open and close eyes, grip and release the non-paralyzed or weak hand. They, so they follow commands, or they don't. Best gaze, that tests your horizontal eye movements. So they follow, they follow the, the light or the pencil. Zero is normal. Two is deviation or gaze parasite. One eye doesn't track. Visual fields. We have to test, you know, like they do when you go get your driver's test. You look in the thing and, they, well, we, we just test. Okay, can you see my fingers wiggle? Obviously, I can't until I get out to about here. Uh, okay, right there. You test gaze up here, test visual field here. So it, it takes a little time. This is an important one because people often will be otherwise okay but have a, have a visual field defect. So zero is no visual loss. One is partial sector loss. You're losing some. Two is a complete loss on on the on the sides or completely blind which is quite a significant field loss facial palsy oh we're getting into the fast testing here almost show me your teeth raise your eyebrows close your eyes zero is normal movement one minor paralysis two partial paralysis of the lower face three complete paralysis of one or both uh, one side of the face or both sides of the face. Five and six are motor arm and leg, and so we're getting into so we're getting into fast test. Extend the arm, zero, no drift. One is drift. Two is drift, but the patient can resist gravity. Three is a limb falls; they have no effort against gravity. And four is no movement at all. And then we do a further addition of limb ataxia. They do the finger, finger to nose test. You move your hand about a little bit and they finger to nose. If you fail it, you do this. You know, you miss. You know, if you have a big nose, it makes it easier. And then you do a shin test. Put your, put your heel on a shin and you go all the way down to the foot. People with ataxia cannot do that. So once again, zero to two. That tests the cerebellum. It's really, we used to get to sit them up and make them walk, but they'd fall over and that was not good. Sensory. Pinprick sensation. Zero to two again, total sensory loss. Patient is not aware of being touched, face, arm, leg. Usually it's in the same place that the paralysis is. Best language. Now these are fun. Name all the objects on the card, read all the sentences, and describe what's happening in the picture. Well, that's for these ones here. So they have to describe what's happening in this picture, which is trauma about to happen. Uh, Describe all these objects and um, read all the sentences. I had to get the sentences here. So these are the sentences. Then there's another one. Disarthria. It's an adequate speech. So you give them this, uh, this list and they read all these or they speak it. Now, obviously, they fail automatically if they can't read, if they're aphasic and they can't read. But this is also scored in a zero to two basis. Now, then neglect, extinction and inattention, the last thing. People with, sometimes with a stroke, particularly in the, in the frontal and temporal cortex, they will not, they, they have what's called neglect. They don't they don't seem to be aware that they have a paralyzed side. Or they don't seem to be aware they have a left side of their body. Or So they, 
they don't do anything with that. They just completely ignore it. If you put something over so they can, they, they're not paralyzed, but they won't reach for it. They won't even see it on that side. So we test. Yeah, and you may have gotten the idea that they have neglect while we've done the tests already because they haven't been able to move or they don't pay attention to the fact that you're trying to do pinprick uh, testing on them. Now, your total score is 0 to 42. Anything greater than 25 is severe neurologic impairment. 15 to 24 is severe. 5 to 14, moderately severe. And less than 5 is mild impairment. If people come in and they have uh, an impairment of 2, so they haven't failed much of anything, even though they probably have had a stroke, we're probably not going to give them TPA. They're probably not going to become a neuro 911 because that's it's a dangerous drug, has side effects, mostly bleeding and things like that, and that's not much of a defect. People go home with less than five, and they function at home. Um, now, a two-point or greater increase when you re when you do the test again. So an hour, I did the test. They come back from CAT scan. I do the test again, and they're two points worse. That shows stroke progression. Now, what does this make a difference? Okay, initial score of seven was a good cut cutoff point. A score of seven. Uh, or greater than 7, the 70, 65%, almost 70% almost of those patients got worse if their initial score was 7, which means that uh, you probably needed to treat those people. That's a, I, if they have more than 7, that patient needs to have rapid evaluation and treatment. If it's less than seven, it only their worsening rate was only fifteen percent. They have give you a little bit more time, a little, and, and they're less likely to progress to a bad stroke. Less than five NIHSS, patient gets discharged home generally. NIHSS of six to thirteen, discharged to rehab because they've got some persistent problem. Greater than 13, discharged in a nursing home. You know what that means. Now, with intracranial hemorrhage, more than 20 is a 70% likelihood of, that this is an intracranial hemorrhage. If it's, and of course, we're going to know that anyway because of the CAT scan. If it's NIHSS of less than 20, it's only a 3% likelihood of, a, of, a, of this being an intracerebral hemorrhage. So when you arrive to the ED, they will do the NIHSS, and based on that, that that's your baseline. That's the baseline. They readjust, they recheck it several times, and this also goes, this also comes in real, if the patient did meet Yes, this can have TPA. Then, then they get TPA, and an hour later, their NIHSS, which was 12 to say to start with, is now five or less. Hey, this is a win. They're getting better. So, okay. Uh, let's take a break for about. Five minutes only while we set up Dr. Basson. Okay. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to as a, a, a in a return visit 
uh, Dr. Suri Fassen, who is the um, who is a neurologist and the head of the stroke program at uh, Peace Out Southwest. So she's going to correct many of the things that I told you and tell tell you all about the stroke program at Peace Health and where we've gone and where we're going and uh, what's happened in the last some updates on things. Can you, this is, does this sound okay? I don't hear myself in the back, but can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. No problem? Okay. Um, thank you, and it's really exciting to be here. It's been two and a half years, and I remember that because last time I was here, I was about 10 months pregnant, and so I'm smaller version, but much more exhaustive version, so please pardon the coffee, but I will be <laughs> drinking that through the talk. Um, I also want to introduce Louise Jenkins. Louise, you wave. You guys, some of you may know her. Louise is the stroke program manager. And if there are any questions after the talk, um, things come up. If you'd like us to speak in another um, forum or closer to home, I know some of you are from quite a ways away, um, you can get in touch with Louise. And I um, also want to thank Louise for putting together some of the slides that you'll see at the end. And uh, we're going to start with a couple of cases. Actually, we'll start with one case, do a second case in uh, a few slides. But this was uh, Holly the homemaker who was actually at home with her husband making jam for her friends around the holiday time. And her husband left to run an errand and came back and the patient was confused. Uh, and he called EMS appropriately and came to the ER. Now, this was her initial head CT, which is a normal head CT, and that's what you expect to see probably about the first six hours after a stroke. Um, a head CT is normal, and we only give TPA if the head CT is normal. We're not really looking for a stroke or expecting a stroke, but we want to make sure there's no blood. And the story I got, I asked his, the husband 10 times what happened, that she was sitting in the kitchen, she was just confused. She was just sitting in a chair confused. She hadn't finished making her jam yet. So we go ahead, we give her TPA. She's unable to talk. She's really agitated, but she just can't talk. Um, and within say, 10 minutes of getting the TPA, she develops, I don't know if you can see here, this huge hematoma on her head. This just giant goose egg is growing in front of our eyes. And said, are you sure that nothing else happened? And she said, well, actually, no. What happened was I came in. She was on the ground on her head. I put her back in the chair. So uh, unfortunately, she had pretty much received all of her TPA at this point. And a few hours later, this was her scan. And you can see this white material here is blood. And that's in her ventricles. And probably what she had when she fell, she a few vessels burst and she got TPA and she developed an interventricular hemorrhage. Um, fortunately, she was no worse for the wear. She actually didn't get much improvement from the TPA, but she didn't have any ill effect from this, but that's just luck. Um, but my point in bringing this case to your attention is that history is truly everything for us. And you know, again, I, I tried really hard. I asked every question I could. I asked it three or four times, and he just didn't give me the history that I wanted. Maybe I wasn't specific enough. But it's where we really depend on you, person in the field who sees what's happening at the home. If you see something odd, if you see that the patient's on the ground, if you see that, um, you know, a lamp is broken, something like that, all of those pieces of information are really helpful for us. Um, the most important piece of information is last known normal time. And as you know, it's a really hard piece of data to get. And the reason is that when you ask a family member, if the patient's unable to talk to you, they're going to say, this happened at 10. And 10 is the time they found the problem. What we need to know is the last time the patient was normal, not the time they noticed a problem. It might be the same time. Sometimes these things are witnessed, patient's having dinner. They stop using their left side. The family says, I was there when this happened. But more often than not, the patient went to sleep and woke up with a problem. Or with Holly, someone leaves the house, they come back, 
So the time that Holly was last known was the time the husband left the house. We don't know if this happened 30 seconds before he got home or 30 seconds after we left. he left. We have to assume the longest time frame for the safety of the patient. We can give TPA up to four and a half hours in many patients, three hours depending on age, we'll go over that in a little bit, but up to four and a half hours. But if someone's out of the four and a half hour window, it's not really safe to give it. So that's why that last known normal time is so critical. Recent surgeries or medical procedures, and really it's the last three months that we, carry about, that we care about. Three months is probably a really long time. Um, that's always been the recommendation, is three months. But uh, as we'll talk about in a little bit, the recommendations are changing. We really wanna know is, did someone have a major surgery? Uh, not really did someone, you know, get a paper cut. We don't really care. Did someone have a major surgery? Did someone have a lumbar puncture? Did somebody have anything happen that if you were to give them a blood thinner, they do not have a compressible site? That's really what you want to get, get facts about. And so you just ask the family, has this person had any surgery in the last three months? Hopefully a surgery will ring a bell. Um, severe recent trauma. And severe is, is severe. Again, it's not I hit my head on the cabinet. It's we, we know what severe trauma is. You were in the hospital. You passed out. Uh, you needed surgery. You needed a blood transfusion. Um, we like to know about minor trauma. The lady that I just showed you, she probably wouldn't say she had a severe trauma. But her trauma happened an hour before we gave her TPA. Um, family contact. This is something that's really tricky. If a stroke patient cannot talk, we really can't give them the treatment they need without a history, and we can't get a history from them. So we depend on their family, someone that knows their history. And what happens is the patient comes to us and their family gets in the car and follows you here. And they're not at the hospital by the time you get there because you go faster than they do. And we sit there and we wait. And they're in the car, so they may not be answering their phone, and, or they're out of phone range, and we have on multiple occasions not been able to treat a patient because we cannot find that family member. So what we usually ask in an ideal world is that the family, someone, the person that knows the patient the best, knows their medical history the best, to stay at home with the phone. It's really hard to tell a family member that, and we get that. They want to be with their loved one in the hospital. But they're going to be the most helpful if they stay at home by the phone until someone from the ER calls them and says, okay, you can come in now. Because we can't do anything without history if a patient can't talk to us. And then a complete medication list. Um, obviously, if you can get that when you're at the house, sometimes people keep it on their fridge, in their purse, whatever. Um, and if you, there's one question you're gonna ask, it's, are you on a blood thinner? Um, we do not consider aspirin or clopidogrel, which is Plavix. We don't consider either of those a blood thinner, although it's helpful to know. Um, so if they say, yes, I am, you want to know, what is it? Because if it's aspirin, I don't care. Um, but blood thinners, for obvious reasons, make us very worried. We don't want to give TPA, which is one of the strongest blood thinners known to someone who is on a strong blood thinner. It used to be really easy. The only blood thinner that we knew about was warfarin or Coumadin, and we never give TPA if the INR is greater than 1.7. So a patient would come in, we would check an INR, 1.8, great, we're done, you can't get TPA, or 1.6, you're in, we're, we're in business. But now there are a number of other blood thinners, and we can't easily test for them. So these are the, the ones that you will most commonly see, Eliquis or Apixaban is the new favorite for atrial fibrillation, stroke prevention, atrial fibrillation. Pradaxa, um, still a lot of patients getting Pradaxa out there, but becoming a little less popular. And then Rivaroxaban or Xarelto. Sometimes people are on these for um, other reasons, DVT, PE, someone had a knee replacement, hip surgery, sometimes they're on these for a week to prevent a DVT and a PE. But Eliquis is becoming more and more popular as the first line for prevention of stroke with atrial fibrillation. These are the um, sample packs, okay? So sometimes someone, they haven't really started it yet or they just got a dose from their doctor. 
And I want you to take a good look at these because if you see anything like these around the house, please bring them in. Please just grab the package and bring it in. Um, it's really, really helpful. Again, there's no quick blood test. There is a quick blood test for Pradaxa. It's called a thrombin time, and we can check that pretty quickly. Um, but if we don't know the patient's on this, we would never check a thrombin time. It's really expensive. It takes a while. It's a special test. Um, if we know, then we would check it. If the thrombin time is out, we can't give TPA. If they missed their last 10 doses, then uh, we can give them TPA. But Eliquis, Xarelto, Pradaxa, there's no generic yet for these, so that's why I'm using the trade name. Um, almost all of them have an X sound in it, <laughs> if you want to get that way. Some, several of them are 10A inhibitors, so, um, and Pradaxa is a direct thrombin inhibitor, but these are both apixaban, rivaroxaban, have an X, very clever 10A inhibitor, so Roman numeral 10. Um, but again, please keep your eyes open for these. It is critical information. All right, so um, TPA. TPA is still the only FDA-approved medication for acute ischemic stroke. It's been years and years and years. It's kind of crazy how the cardiologists have developed a whole handful of other things they can use. We still really are left with TPA. Um, the packaging is changing for TPA. There are a number of reasons. There was a law that came out, I don't know, many, about 10 years ago now, but it's now finally becoming um, effective, and that is that all drugs have to have the same format of labeling. And so their contraindications have to be proven contraindications. They are truly proven reasons that you cannot give a benison, not just reasons that were not used in the, in the trial. So this is the list that um, Genentech, who makes Activase, or this is the, the generic name for TPA, say you cannot use TPA in these situations. Current intracranial hemorrhage, obviously. If you have blood in your head, do not give this blood thinner. If you have a subarachnoid, active internal bleeding, recent, again, within three months, intracranial or intraspinal surgery or serious head trauma, and then it says this very vague thing, presence of intracranial conditions that might increase the risk of bleeding. That's sort of whatever you find to be uh, an intracranial condition that increases the risk of bleeding. Bleeding diathesis, which they say is a platelet count of less than 100,000, and severe uncontrolled hypertension. So you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Only seven, seven things you have to worry about. This is our list, okay? There's a few more than seven there. Uh, I did count them all up, but the reason why all of these things are on here is we want people to think about them. We have a caveat here, and we feel really strongly about this, and this says, with careful consideration of risk to benefit, patients may receive TPA despite one or more contraindications. And that is because sometimes we have patients that come in, for example, who um, maybe did have a stroke two months ago, um, and that currently is stroke in th the last three months, and they'll say, the family says, you know what, this is such a devastating stroke that I know my mother would rather have a head bleed and die than live like this. And we'll talk to them and have a really serious conversation, and sometimes we'll give the medicine. Um, or sometimes blood pressure is above 185 over 110, but we give them some labetal and it comes down. So we want to go through each and every one of these points to make sure we understand the risk and we can explain them very confidently and thoroughly to the family and the patient. But um, that list is getting smaller and smaller and probably for good reason. This list is so long because when the initial study came out, I think it was 96 or 98 that proved that TPA is effective. It was a study. So it was a big multi-center study and they wanted the results to look good. So they said anyone who's had a stroke in the past three months, they're not going to look good anyway. So we don't want to put them in the study because we don't know how that's going to look. Um, anyone older than 80, eh, we're not going to treat patients older than 80. So that's, that's, uh, 
that's why you might hear about the package insert changing. Patients that can get TPA after three hours, three to four and a half hours, patients who are, they have to be less than the age of 80, um, they cannot be on any oral anticoagulant. So let's say they're on warfarin, but the INR is 1.5. Theoretically, the rules say you can't give those patients TPA after three hours. Um, if they have a really high NIHSS, so that score greater than 25, and history of both stroke and diabetes. They've had stroke and they have diabetes, they're not supposed to get it. Totally arbitrary. Again, it goes back to how that study was performed. They took those people out because the results probably wouldn't have been as good. We've had many cases where we talk to the family and say, you're 82. This is an arbitrary number. It's four hours. What do you want to do? Um, but those are, those are the recommendations. All right, any questions about those things? We'll go on to our second case. All right, so this is Terry the teacher. Um, some of you may have heard of this case. It was in the newspaper, but uh, in the interest of confidentiality, I won't say any more. This is a, a young lady. She was 40, 40? Um, teacher, uh, worked for the school system. And she's talking, she's in her office talking to a student actually about the college plans and suddenly can't talk. Um, and then becomes unable to move. She just, she's sitting in the chair and she can't talk. She's staring, she cannot move anything. And this sort of came and went. And then she would start talking again and then she'd be able to walk and then she couldn't move and these sort of fluctuating symptoms. And the student actually immediately was the one who said something's not right with this lady, went to the school nurse. Um, had to be carried into the front uh, lobby where EMS was called. And in the ED, she's perfectly fine. She says, I don't know what happened. I couldn't talk. I couldn't move. She walks to the bathroom. She comes back. And then she does it again. And she's just acting really weird. She goes to get a CT. She becomes comatose, stops breathing, and gets intubated. She's totally healthy. She has no real medical problems. She does see a chiropractor for neck pain and had a neck manipulation. So the chiropractor had cracked her neck some point in the last few months. Otherwise, is a really healthy person. This is her head CT, and it really, on first pass, looks totally normal. There's no blood. There's, for those of you that aren't familiar with looking at head CTs, you have to sort of reverse it in your head. This is the right. This is the left. It's like you're looking underneath the patient up. So you have to reverse. Here are the eyeballs, the sinuses, the back of the head. And this is the basilar artery. What looks bright white on CT? Density, right? So heard a few murmurs over here. Bone and blood, right? Bone and blood. And that includes thrombus. So a blood clot looks bright. So here's bone. It's just the base of the skull. And then this nice bright white dot. So someone who's 95 years old with a lot of calcium in their vessels might look that way too. But you'll look at other vessels and they also look bright white. Someone who's 40 and healthy and doesn't have any risk factors, it's subtle, but their basilar should look like this, which is essentially the same color as the brain. This looks the same color as bone. Okay, so I don't know if you all can appreciate that or not. But that's a really scary sign in someone with these symptoms. You have a young person with neck pain with this fluctuating history of, I can't talk, now I can talk. I can't move, now I can move. Um, and you can't really put it together. You know, it just seems weird. Why is your face weak, and then your arm weak, and then your leg weak? You always have to think of the basilar artery. This is a normal scan. This is the basilar artery right here along the base of the brain, and this is this lady's scan. There's no basilar artery. Gone. And basically it was filled with clot. So why does clot in the basilar artery give you these problems? Well, here's a picture of the basilar I had to take this from the internet, so I apologize about this background. But here's the basilar artery, and you can see the basilar artery runs, comes up here, the vertebral arteries, becomes the basilar artery. And I like this view, it shows you, here's the basilar artery, and off of the basilar artery are these, what's called the 
perforating arteries. So these little tiny arteries that come off and they feed all of the structures in the ponds. And what happens is you get a clot here in the basilar artery and you start basically picking off these tiny little vessels in a very random fashion. Okay, so you might pick off this one and it hits your corticospinal tract. So you get a leg on one side becomes weak. And then as this clot starts sort of moving up, becoming bigger and bigger, you're going to pick off another one of these little tiny arteries and maybe you'll hit your facial nerve on the other side. And you'll pick off another one and your abducens nerve, so now your eyes aren't tracking perfectly. And then maybe you'll get the trigeminal nerve. So then your face gets weak and it's maybe on the same side as the leg, maybe not. And your face gets sort of numb on one side and now you're, you're dizzy and you're incoordinated. But that's the reason why basilar artery strokes are so confusing is because it's not, there's a lot of, a lot of pathways in this tiny, tiny space. And depending on which of these minuscule little perforating arteries you pick off, you can look like you're having an MCA stroke or you can look like you're totally crazy. And usually they are young people who have no risk factors and they are thought to just be kooky. So you have to have a very high index of suspicion. And usually it starts with, this is a bleed in the same location, but you get a little, probably let's say this is a little stroke here, so you just are weak in a leg and as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, you get more and more systems involved. This is always, as you know, a very worrisome sign. I call this the creepy uncle sign because I had an <laughs> uncle that always looked like this. <laughs> um, this is called a skew deviation, okay? So this is a disconjugate gaze. Disconjugate gaze, specifically skew deviation is one eye down and one eye either straight ahead or up. That's the skew. It's not one out, one out. It's one down. And that is always, always very worrisome for a brain stem problem, okay? You have a patient that things are just not making sense and they're comatose and you open their eyes and you see this, one eye down and one eye not down, be very, very worried, okay? This is a, something is going on in this person's brain stem, unless the family says they've always looked like this, so don't worry about it. That's just Bob. Bob's got those weird eyes. Okay, so this is this woman's um, arterial. She got TPA. Okay, so this woman is recognized she's having a basilar artery stroke. She gets TPA, and then she actually went to the cath lab. And the reason is that basilar artery strokes are so devastating. Um, they can, as you know, lead to locked in syndrome. If you completely blow out your pons, what happens is you are awake, you're alert, you cannot move. So you're you are locked in. It's a really the most, most neurologists and most people, most of humanity considers it the worst of all potential outcomes. And so we will do everything for these patients. It doesn't matter if they're four and a half hours, eight hours, 24 hours, unless there's a really good reason that we are going to hurt them or the damage has been done, we will do everything to make these patients better. So she got TPA, then she went to the cath lab, and what was interesting is here, by the time she got to the cath lab, her basilar was open. The TPA worked. Um, and you can see here, these are the vertebral arteries right here. They join up to become the basilar. Here's her basilar. Here's her vertebrals. You can see the problem actually started here. You can see both vertebrals have little missing chunks. And what happened to her is she had vertebral artery dissections. So a tear in the wall of the blood vessel, maybe or maybe not from the chiropractic manipulation. We do see, um, I don't know, once or t probably three or four times a year, someone who goes to the chiropractor, and it's always with that very quick rotation, um, getting your neck cracked. And in some people, we don't know why, they go to a chiropractor 100 times, the 101st time, say, I was just really bad, I don't know, it was really painful, and my neck's been hurting ever since then, and it's they, their vertebral arteries tear. We actually had one, a young guy came in, this is about six months ago, he had the same problem, he had a vertebral artery dissection, 
But his anatomy was such that he developed a clot, but it went back down. Instead of going up the bathroom, it went back down this anterior spinal artery, and he had a stroke in his spinal cord. So that's also an interesting sort of factoid. If you have time to ask a patient you think has a posterior circulation stroke, have you had any neck trauma? You know, did you get into an accident? Did you go to see a chiropractor? Um, we had one case, it's not funny, but a guy who was doing shots with his friends over and over and over again. And this is what happened to him. He turned out just fine. But um, anything that makes you think of that quick head rotation. Yeah, so be warned, all of you. Um, okay, so let's say a person has uh, just the vertebral artery. Just the vertebral artery is involved and not the basilar artery. Um, usually what happens is this is the pica, posterior inferior cere uh, cerebellar artery. That's the first one to get nicked off. And what you'd see is it's called a Wallenberg syndrome. So the vert doesn't go all the way up to the pons, but you kind of just get right there in the medulla. Um, and again, a lot, of, a lot of real estate there. Uh, I like this picture. Um, it shows the fibers coming down from the brain, crossing in the, uh, in the midbrain, coming down. And here's the medulla, this yellow triangle here is the stroke. And you can see what you're ticking off. You have vestibular nuclei, um, spinothalamic tract, so pain and temperature, um, nucleus ambiguous. That's why these patients obviously kind of hoarse. They say, my voice sounds weird. Um, inferior cerebellar peduncle is back here. Um, and so these patients, what's confusing about these patients is they'll say that I have one side of my body, my arm and leg feel kind of numb, but what's weird is my face on the other side is sort of numb, and that's because of the trigeminal. So where is that here? I can't see what blue. Someone else might be able to see it, but it, here it is. Kind of comes down all the way here, the trigeminal tract, so you get face on one side, body on the other side, and these are also patients who people say, that doesn't make any sense. It has to be all on one side of the body or you're just kooky, you're making this up. There are parts of the body that you get these cross signs and if you're not thinking about this and not looking carefully, you can miss it. All right, drip and ship. How many of you actually take these patients from one hospital that got TPA to another? Probably all of you, anyone who's EMS maybe? Okay. So frequently we'll have patients, I know locally we'll have patients from Longview um, that they get TPA, then they come to us. Or sometimes we give patients TPA, we might be dark, so we don't have anyone in our cath lab any particular night. We have to move a patient to OHSU to get to their cath lab. So a couple things I want to mention for drip and ship. Drip and ship again means someone got TPA, you have to move them to another hospital while the TPA is still running or shortly after the infusion has stopped. I know there is, Dr. Whitwer, wherever he is, I don't know where he went, there he is in the back. Uh, there is a protocol um, that you all have for drip and ship, but a couple of things I wanted to note, or one big one, is allergic reactions to TPA are very, very scary. They are totally unpredictable. Less than 1% of the time this happens. Um, it can be associated with ACE inhibitor use. Um, it usually happens within the first 15 minutes of the infusion, but it can happen minute 59 of 60. Um, this is obviously the scariest, is this angioedema. And for whatever reason, in stroke patients, sometimes it's one half of the tongue. Doesn't make it any less dangerous. But um, you want to ask the patient, are you feeling any tingling? Are you feeling tongue swelling? If you think your patient's slurred speech is getting worse, have them stick out their tongue and make sure it's not this. They're not having an allergic reaction to the TPA. And then hives, urticaria. Uh, we had a patient two weeks ago. Everything was going great, and he developed hives from his waist to the top of his head. Um, horrible, severe allergic reaction. And your protocol would be the same. Whatever you would do for someone with anaphylaxis, um, angioedema, you do the same thing and obviously you stop the TPA, okay? Stop the offending agent. Um, so
So we've had a couple of patients that were shipped. They said, yeah, their slurred speech was getting worse and worse and worse. This is what was happening. Okay. All right. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I want to thank Louise. Put these slides together. These are our data. We were asked to share what our numbers look like. Um, these are our stroke volumes. You can see up here, this is January through December of last year. Um, we had 617 total stroke patients. That is a ton. That's up there with major uh, academic centers. Uh, ischemic stroke, you can see the numbers per, per month, but always ischemic stroke is higher than hemorrhagic stroke. And TIA sort of fluctuates. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Um, numbers do fluctuate a little, but we're seeing about 30 to 50 patients a month, which is quite a lot. Okay, these are stroke codes. And what Louise did here was pretty cool. These are what you call in as a code three stroke is blue. We have a protocol called 911 upgrade. Patient comes in, the, in as a code three stroke. They get to their room in the ER and the ER physician is at the bedside either by the time the patient moves from the rig to the bed or within probably two or three minutes and they evaluate the patient. If they say, yeah, this is a patient that could get TPA or go to the cath lab, they call out a code, it's called a 911 upgrade. That is received by the neurologist, the um, cath lab physician, the entire cath lab team, the radiologist, the pharmacist, everyone knows this is the real deal. Patient, if there are patients on the CT table, they're moved off the table to make an open CT table. Pharmacy call says what's the weight. They pre-calculate the TPA. They don't mix it, but they pre-calculate the dose. The neurologist calls back within two minutes and the ball starts rolling. Um, so the point of this is that you guys are doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job of calling these right. Um, what you don't want to see is down here that they're not being called they get to the ED and the ED physician says, oh my God, this is a stroke we didn't know. Definitely want to over call. A lot of these are strokes. They're not incorrect calls. It's just they're not patients that we can do anything about. Their stroke is either too old. Some, there's some other reason they can't be treated for their stroke. But these numbers look exactly how we would like to see them. So here are the stroke codes. I'm sorry, the uh, code three strokes. These are our 911 upgrades in red. And in green are the patients that actually receive TPA. You can see a small percentage of those 911s actually get TPA. Some are bleeds, some are drug overdoses. You know, you can imagine the reasons why, but these are the percent of stroke codes receiving TPA. So it's about, you know, varies month to month, but up to 34 percent of the stroke codes that you guys call get TPA. That's huge. That's huge. Um, so anyway, we want to congratulate you. You guys are making our lives much easier, making the patient's lives much better by calling those when you see them. These are our acute interventions percent, um, and this is sort of a three quarters of a year, January through October 2014. These are the numbers of acute ischemic strokes that we get in. Um, again, these are three month blocks, and this is just two months. We don't have the data full yet from from uh, December, but you can see 119 patients. This is a banner quarter, um, but 70 this so far in October and November. These are the patients neuro intervention by neuro intervention. These are patients that go to the cath lab. Few of the patients go to the cath lab. Few patients get TPA, but overall between 10 and 20% get intervention. And again, we think that is actually pretty similar to major academic centers, having 20% of your patients with stroke getting interventions. Let's talk about the cath lab. We had some questions about how do we know who goes to the cath lab, who doesn't go. There have been many studies showing that patients greater than the age of 80 do not do well when their stroke is treated in the cath lab. And what can we do in the cath lab? We can give TPA directly into the clot. We can um, suck the clot out using a vacuum. You can use a little corkscrew, pull the clot out. Sort of the favorite device now is called a um, Mercy, not Mercy, Solitaire. <laughs> Sorry, Mercy's the old, uh, older version. Solitaire. Solitaire is a stent. 
So it's called a stent retriever. The way it works is you go in, you can put it past the clot and then deploy the stent. So it opens up and the struts stick in the thrombus and it stays there for about a minute and then the entire stent open is pulled out with the clot hopefully attached to it. Couple nice things about it. Number one, once your stent is open, you have blood flow. Okay, the old devices that were aimed on pulling the clot out, um, either vacuum or the little corkscrew, you don't have perfusion until your vessel is open. These new devices, if you can get it past the clot and open it, your vessel's open. Okay, so they are immediately restoring blood flow. Um, doesn't always work. You can't always get past the clot. You can't always get the clot out. But our results have been very, um, very reassuring that this is the technology that we want to use. Greater than the age of 80, study after study have shown those patients overall as a group do not do well. So our criteria are basically if a patient comes in and they are less than the age of 80, they will get a CT scan and a CT angiogram. If that angiogram shows a clot, they go to the cath lab. If the patient is over the age of 80, they do not get a CT angiogram. Sometimes you get a really robust 90-year-old. They are totally normal. They have no risk factors. They were golfing an hour ago. You get a CTA. You make, you make a decision based on the patient. But overall, um, that's our protocol. Less than the age of 80, they get a CTA, we consider going to the cath lab. Um, we have physician call coverage for the cath lab about 85% of the time. We have three physicians working on a fourth one getting trained that take patients to the cath lab. We have a um, transfer agreement with OHSU. We are never dark for stroke because most of the time our strokes can be treated with TPA. So we give patient TPA, we decide they need to go to the cath lab. If we're dark, we will send them to OHSU. Um, we talked about what you can do in the cath lab. Um, this is in last year for three quarters of the year. We did 21 cases in the cath lab. This was pretty awesome. Almost 70% of those patients either went home or to rehab. This is a huge difference if you looked at these numbers the, la the year before. And a lot of this is because of the new technology. Again, opening that vessel early, getting blood flow early makes all the difference for these patients. 14% of these 21 patients went to sniff. 10% went to comfort care or hospice, and 9% died in the hospital. Uh, this is our overall program data. Uh, these are the percent of stroke patients discharged home. Red is hemorrhagic, and blue is ischemic. Um, you can see here, it changes a little bit per month, but about 50% or more of our patients are being sent home. Hemorrhagic stroke um, varies month to month, but up to 70%, which is great. Uh, mortality rate for ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, you can see, again, varies. Sometimes um, zero, so that's a good month. Um, sometimes it looks really bad, but it just varies month to month. Sometimes you get a month where you get, and they're all, real, they're all NIHSS of 30. Uh, we like to look at the trends overall. These are numbers that we follow very closely. These are the readmit within 30 days. Ischemic stroke, uh, the number we try to get below is eight, right, Louise? Eight percent. Um, you see here we had some rough months, 14 percent, 16 percent. That's numbers that we don't want to see, but overall we're looking right around eight percent, two percent. So, um, and then hemorrhagic strokes, zero readmit. Um, as Louise mentioned to me, those patients often, we have only a few patients and they die, so they're not going to be readmitted, but anyway, zero still looks good. Um, <laughs> and stroke average length of stay, um, ischemic stroke average length of stay across the country is three and a half days. Um, and hemorrhagic stroke length of stay is more, I think it's four and a half or five and a half days. I don't know for sure, but um, we're staying pretty close to that. We don't push patients out of the hospital, but we don't want people to stay unnecessarily. They get bed sores, DVTs, they're not getting the rehab they need once they leave the hospital. Um, and so we want patients to be where they can rehab the best, and that's not usually in the hospital. So we do watch this number carefully. 
we're doing a pretty good job of getting patients to where they need to be to improve from their stroke. And that's it. What questions do you have? Yeah, go ahead. Someone comes in, they had a TBI with a bleed. Like years ago? Sure, or whatever. Uh-huh. Probably not. Probably not. If it was a bleed from their trauma, mm -hmm. probably not. It's just an isolated event. Um, assuming they didn't have any vessel injury, thing like that. What we want to know is someone have a severe TBI, um, you know, very soon to having their ischemic stroke that would make you worried about giving TPA. Not usually. What other questions do you have? Think about our program. Nothing, Marty. Anything? I should mention that um, Holly Homemaker, um, she did not do as well as we had hoped. She came in not able to speak. She got a little bit of her language function back, but not um, what we had hoped for. And um, Terry, the teacher, did phenomenally well, um, had a big stroke in her pons, but after a couple days was essentially normal and um, very little deficit and is just doing awesome. So. Thank you to all of you for your hard work and um, you, again, make our jobs easier and you make the patients' lives infinitely better. So thank you so much. And yeah, be careful at the chiropractor. <laughs> Can I throw in something? I just want to give you a heads up that we're working on a process improvement right thank now you. at the hospital. And one of the things we're working with, with Dr. Whitwer in the direct to CT uh, process. So you'll be seeing this set up for uh, uh, case reviews right now. Thank you. Marlo? <laughs> she lost the little fuzzy thing. Can you hear me?
hear me clearly in the back? So just a few case reviews. Uh, we'll review the criteria for some of the ongoing studies, and then we'll be done. So case number one was uh, the crews who dispatched code three on a CBA. And um, it was a 55-year-old woman, 80 kilograms, uh, lying on the floor, ABCs intact, um, with obvious left-sided paralysis. Uh, the roommate thinks um, she was walking around about three hours previous and a history of a, of a remote prior CVA. So the, um, this is the, uh, the documentation provided very, uh, very appropriately, uh, documented the time, uh, time last seen normal, the GCS, um, EKG and blood glucose. And so trans transported code three is a stroke alert with some slight improvement in the left-sided droop, um, left-sided movement and uh, facial droop. So in the hospital, was uh, found to have an acute ischemic stroke in the right MCA territory. Um, once uh, some additional history was gotten from the, uh, from the bystanders, just determined to be barely outside that TPA window. And then with the CT angiogram, it was discussed, just too far to be, uh, to be intervened on. Um, was a Kaiser patient, ultimately was transferred to, uh, to Sunnyside for additional care. But, uh, but ultimately, ultimately did well. But again, as you've heard multiple times today, the emphasizes the critical importance of the history, getting bystanders who can provide as much history as able. This is, you know, as you can see, this is one of those, uh, that small number of cases, not amenable to intervention, just outside the TPA window. Case number two uh, was a 55-year-old woman uh, complaining of difficulty breathing, with asthma attack, uh, but the crew arrives to find that the patient is pulseless and apneic. And so CPR was uh, started immediately. Um, this was also a very large patient in a small place. Um, and so continuous CPR, um, placement of the eye gel, and so they, this but even with a large patient, the initial resuscitation was able to be done with the IGL. Uh, patient was able to be oxygenated and ventilated and then returned to spontaneous circulation. Appropriately, IGL removed, CT tube placed um, to get a secure airway given that the patient was still attended. And then uh, transferred, got some ongoing sedation, uh, some treatment for reactive airway disease, which was probably at least a contributor to the arrest but still comatose. So assisted ventilation. Um, you can see that initially the, uh, the eye gel for, uh, for intubation. And then um, visualization documented very high end tidal CO2 consistent. So this is a patient who's going to be very, have, have a severe respiratory acidosis because of an obstructive, um, because of an obstructive process. So very, very acidotic and also hypoxemic. Uh, but you can see with, uh, with the ventilation, CO2 is coming down, pulse ox is coming up, um, and then for appropriately for large patient, padding under the shoulders. Um, it's not specifically documented here. Remember that keeping the, uh, the nasal cannula on a patient like this who's hypoxemic is going to give you more time uh, to, uh, to get the tube and then verified, um, continuous CO2. You can see that with, with this intubation attempt, uh, because you, you've got this patient who is breathing and the breathing stops, the end tidal CO2 goes back up. So these are patients that especially patients like this that are very acidotic, they're at high risk for re-arrest when you're re-intubating them. So it's important to keep that time as short as possible. You can fix the hypoxemia with the cannula, but that doesn't uh, fix the respiratory acidosis. Um, but then good bagging, um, getting closer to eucapnic with an entitled CO2 of 35, but still a GCS of three, um, some sedation, and then maintaining this around 30. In this case, you know, be permissive, but in the, somewhere in that 30 to 35 range is where you want to keep uh, keep a patient like this. But as you're doing this, you're fixing uh, you're fixing their respiratory acidosis. Um, so, 
uh, the patient had a normal echocardiogram, uh, normal cardiac markers, was able to give additional history. Um, so the reactive airway disease didn't help, um, but neither did the methamphetamine. Um, but then did have some uh, did have some rib pain after CPR. I think that's probably a fair trade off. Um, and uh, but was discharged on day ten CPC one, so that's cerebral performance category one, meaning um, essentially back to back to baseline level of function. Questions about this case? Back to normal methamphetamine. Yeah, back to normal. <laughs> uh, but in, it's in very very well managed in the pre-hospital setting and, and uh, clearly a, a safe. Uh, so case number three was a 58-year-old man with a sudden onset of chest pain and dizziness. Had had some similar episodes before, but they all went away on his own. Um, sitting in a parked car. Uh, GCS 15, uh, but uh, hypotensive. Uh, ventricular tachycardia. Um, on the on the four lead EKG, and so um, given given Versed and cardioverted at 100 joules. Um, then uh, again, given Versed, uh, cardioverted at 150 joules, um, goes into goes into cardiac arrest, uh, defibrillated, non synchronized, 200 joules. Um, but then uh, as uh, as the crew is attempting to support his respiration, still has gag, unable to take an oral airway, um, still in ventricular uh, tachycardia. So given, uh, given the first dose of ALPS, um, shocked again, uh, now starting to have some movement, GC GCS of eight, shocked again. And, uh, and then given ALPS number two, again, another shock at 300. Um, and then IGEL, the attempted passage at the IGEL, um, but patient patient was gagging at this point. Um, hypoxemic with an entire CO2 44, and uh, but then now, after this, uh, now in a sinus tachycardia. And so here are some of the strips, and then GC, GCS rapidly improving. So and then here are some of the some of the strips, and then what. Uh, what he ultimately uh, ultimately came to. So this patient had an inferior wall STEMI, um, and so and remember with with the inferior wall, that's where you get you're getting, um, you know, the so you see someone who's hypotensive. There's a large amount of myocardium at risk. This is not an uncommon presentation, and an occlusion of the circumflex artery. Um, <clears throat> It was very small. They were unable to revascularize it, so he's uh, managed medically. Had dual AICD placed, but he did well and uh, and was discharged six days after admission. Um, this this guy seemed to improve pretty rapidly during the pre-hospital course. Um, you can consider um, you can consider RSI if uh, if you've got RSC, but the patient's still gagging and comatose. But if he's rapidly improving. You can manage him um, without without an invasive airway, as the as the crew did here, and uh, and he did very well. Okay. So reminders about the ALP study. Um, so we're doing it for non-traumatic out of hospital cardiac arrest. Um, known um, a exclusion criteria: open label IV amiodarone or lidocaine. If the patient is taking oral lidocaine, that's not a contraindication. Um, remember the protected populations and, uh, and anyone with a no study bracelet. So the, um, this is a question that's come up. So um, anything that the patient had on them when the arrest happened, so an ICD or a life vest, that does not count as a shock. So an AED shock, um, a shock delivered by any EMS personnel does count as a shock, but ICD and life vest do not count as a shock uh, because we, we don't know what that, what that initial rhythm was. Questions about that? Okay. And so the goal is to give the study drugs within 10 minutes or less after arrival. Remember, it can run in the same tube with epi. Um, so only for tiny patients, you're giving just syringe 1A. Otherwise, you're giving 1A and 1B. And then, uh, and then calling the enrollment number. 
This is, I was just talking with uh, one of the cardiologists about this. I mean, they're, they're very excited, even for their in-hospital practice, to have the results of this study. Coming into what's hopefully the last year of this study, um, we're still in the metro area, by far the leader in enrolling people. So uh, the hope is within, so we're gonna wrap up the data collection and then within the next year or two, finally have an answer to the question of what's best to treat this. So your work has been critical to, uh, to do that. Um, it's very, uh, very important to download the CPR process file and notify the code. Uh, notify the, uh, the team about the, uh, the ops kit number. And then finally, <coughs> The sudden unexpected, a sudden, sudden unexplained death study uh, is for, this is, applies to the transporting agencies and this involves drawing blood on patients who have sudden cardiac arrest. Um, not in, this does apply if you get ROSC. Just the only addition to the ALPS exclusions is that overdose is not, ex, um, is not included in this. And this is looking for the genetic markers so we can predict who's at higher risk for sudden cardiac death. Tube gets labeled, um, and then ultimately should make it back <coughs> to the headquarters of the transport agency. And that's all we have. Uh, thank you very much. Great. All right. Next next month is skills month. <laughs>